Oh. Welcome to the farm. I have a new hobby, which is shooting guns. Now, not because I really necessarily want to hunt anything or anything like that, mostly because I saw an episode of Downton Abbey where they all dressed up in their tweed and they went out shooting, and I just thought that was fantastic. So I've got a group of folks coming over to the farm later, and we're gonna do a little shooting, and then I'm gonna put out a spread of a traditional English breakfast. For the ingredients, I'm heading up to Turnip Rock Farm in Clear Lake, Wisconsin, and then it's over to Eat My Fish Bullfrog Farm in Menominee, Wisconsin. But first, Craig and I have some farming to do. Gather with us around the farm table. I'm your host, Inga Witcher. Gather with us around the farm table. A few years ago, I moved up to Wisconsin. I started an organic dairy farm at St. Isidore's Mead. That's when I discovered the abundance of Midwestern local food and small-scale farmers, growing everything from green zebra tomatoes to pasture pork. I'm taking a break from the cows, hitting the road, and seeing if I can't satisfy my epicurious appetite. Oh. That's crazy. This is amazing. Funding for Around the Farm Table is provided in part by Wisconsin Farmers Union, a member-driven organization for family farmers, rural communities, and all people. Wisconsin Farmers Union, united to grow family agriculture. Information at wisconsinfarmersunion.com. With additional support from these community members and friends of Wisconsin Public Television. So once a month we do milk testing here at the farm. And what we want to accomplish by doing that is find out what the somatic cell counts are for each of the cows, how much milk they're giving. And then we can keep a record of that for our own selves so we can just find out if our cows are improving or if they need a little bit more intervention to give more milk or uh, be a better fit for the farm. So we start out, we just, uh, we're just gonna milk this cow, Cecilia here. And we're gonna find out if she's giving more milk than she did last month and if her cell counts went down, which I hope it has. So now that the cow's milked, now we're gonna take the sample. So with bucket milkers, this is different than a lot of how a lot of people test milk because a lot of people don't milk in buckets. But what I do is I have to mix that milk up so I can make sure that I get a true sample. So I go eight times in one direction stirring that milk and then eight times in the other direction stirring that milk. And then I also take the dipper and just mix it up. That way it's getting that true sample of everything here. And Talia, this cow is named Cecilia. So why don't we, I'll give you that and then we'll take it over and weigh how much she did. Okay, so the next process in sampling milk is to find out how much milk that cow is giving. And, and it looks like Cecilia did uh, 31 pounds. So that's 62 pounds a day that Cecilia is giving milk. So Talia, what are those other benefits? Why, why am I milk testing milk? I'm doing it because my dad did it and because I've been doing it, but like, what is the history of milk testing? Sure, so milk testing actually started in the early 1900s and it's a lot different from what we see today. So at that point, the milk tester would come to the farmer's farm unannounced, just show up randomly so there's no <laughs> cheating involved. And then he would have dinner with the family and then he would milk cows and test the milk that night. In the morning, he would wake up with the family again, eat breakfast with them and test cows in the morning. And then he would take those milk samples and all of his data he collected on what the cows have eaten and other information he got from that farmer and he would actually perform the test in his own home. Wow. The only thing we could get at that point was milk pounds and butter fat. Mm -hmm. So we've come a long way. Yeah, because now you can even test for pregnancy in the milk, can't you? Absolutely. So now we're actually looking at somatic cell, butter fat, and protein, which are the major production components, but we can also test for milk pregnancy, even looking for early fresh cow symptoms like ketosis. That is so interesting. I love seeing how technology has evolved, or farming has evolved with technology, and how much of a difference that these things can make on my farm. Absolutely, it's really helpful for culling decisions and for your breeding decisions. So you can also identify that best cow in the herd and the genetics that you want to keep moving in your herd as well. Well good, well I'm gonna get this one dumped and we'll start on some others. Sounds great.
Well, I'm going to finish up testing cows here, and then I'm going to get changed and take you all off to Turner Brock Farm in Clear Lake, Wisconsin, to gather up some ingredients for our shooting breakfast. Well, we're at Turnip Rock Farm. I haven't had a chance to visit my friends Josh and Rayma up at this new farm yet, and I'm excited because Rayma has recently put a creamery in here, and she's doing all sorts of amazing cheeses. So let's find out what's going on. Hello, Rayma. Hi, Inga. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you? Good. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, too. I've been waiting to come and visit you guys up here at your new farm. It's just, it's so fun. Yeah. I love what you're doing. Thank you. Uh, so now you're a full-time cheesemaker. Yes. Right now. Yeah. And it's, how long has it been? Um, we just started um, milking in the spring, so I've just been officially making cheese um, this spring. That's great. And so you're utilizing all the milk from your jerseys right into these cheeses. That's right. Oh, delicious. And you're experimenting with a few different kinds of cheese? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, what kinds are you doing? We're doing some fresh cheeses. So we're doing a feta, ricotta, a quark. Um, and we are doing aged cheeses. So, and they're mostly originals, but based off of traditional recipes. Uh huh. Now, when you do the fresh cheeses, do you have to pasteurize that milk or is it? Yeah, yeah we do. you do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I'm hoping to take some. I've had some friends over. We're doing a little breakfast, and it's sort of a British inspired because you know nice. I love everything British. Yeah. So I wanted to do. Uh, I wanted, was hoping to get some cheeses. And the okay. second you said ricotta, I thought you know I could do like a really great dessert with ricotta, just oh, like yeah. a little bit ricotta. Yeah. So maybe I could grab some of that. Mm -hmm. How are you marketing your cheese? Well, we're marketing mainly through our CSA. We have a 250 member CSA, and. Um, so we uh, do a cheese share. So some of our members have ordered cheese and they get cheese in their CSA box. What a great idea. Yeah. Do you guys still do farmer's markets and things too? Yeah, and we do a farmer's market. So, and we're looking for a little wholesale maybe, but that's a new area yeah. for us. So That's great. I love yeah. the idea of putting it in the CSA box. Because mm -hmm. also, how many CSAs can really offer that? That's, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, and we're trying to have all aspects of the farm working together, and I think that we can offer a full diet CSA this way, and the cows provide fertility for the vegetables, and the whey is an on-farm food source for the pigs. So it's it's a really nice circle that It way. makes sense, mm -hmm. yeah, well good. Well, I saw Josh was out in the field, and I was hoping to get a few other things for this uh, little luncheon. So I tell you what, I'm gonna go see, talk to him a little bit, and then I'm gonna swing back through and get the cheese. That sounds great, we'll see you later then. Thanks. Bye. Hi Josh, how are you doing? Oh good, Inga, how are you? Good, nice to see you. You too. I stopped in the creamery, I saw Rayma. I love what you guys are doing with all the cheeses. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. It's just dynamite. So mm -hmm. now you're offering a full, what is it called, a full diet CSA, is yeah, that right? Yeah, a whole diet CSA. Uh, yeah, we also offer uh, meat and eggs. So what types well of cheese. meat? Uh, we do pork, uh, beef, and chicken. Oh wow, was it the one-stop shop? Yeah, anything you want. <laughs> <laughs> so how many acres are you guys farming all together here? Uh, this is, a, our whole farm is 80. And we have about uh, 10 in vegetables, and then the rest is pasture or hay. I'm doing this like little breakfast thing, but I'm wondering if I can get maybe some greens from you and uh, sure. maybe just cook some of those down with a little bit of that bacon and serve it on the side. Absolutely, there's okay. plenty of them to go around. Alrighty. What is this? Is this a dinosaur kale? Yeah, this is dino kale or lacinato kale. Okay. I like this. I like, but I think I like all different kinds of kale. Yeah, this kale's pretty nice for, uh, you know, even this, just a raw salad if you want to massage it and uh, make a... Like an olive oil or something? Yeah. I'll tell you what, I'm going to need some bacon to go along with this stuff. Well, the pigs look great. Yeah, they're growing fast. Well, now that I've got these amazing ingredients, I'm going to put these in the cooler and head out to Herbie's fish farm in Menominee and get some trout. So I'll see you guys there. Thanks guys, good to see you. Thank Hi you. Sadie, good to see you. Bye. I wanted to stop down here because 
I think the smoked trout's gonna go perfect in the recipe I'm making today, but also because I wanted to talk to Herbie a little bit more about adding value to agriculture. He's kind of a, a great guy to know when you have questions about value added to agriculture. So let's head on down there and we'll see David and Herbie. What are you doing today? I'm sorting some of the fish out. I'm moving the biggest fish from this tank up to the next tank. They've graduated. How do you decide what is big enough? Oh, we got this there? special sorting box here so I can adjust the slots. Oh! The smaller fish will swim right through and a big fish will net over to the next tank. What's the process of, the, of this whole thing? We uh, start from egg, we buy fertilized eggs, hatch them out in some hatching jars. It takes about two years to raise them up to market size where two you've years. seen them. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. For some reason with fish, I thought it was like 30 days and you're eating it. Yeah, these trout grow about a half inch a month. We got 48 degree water. They're pretty efficient at put, putting their food into meat though. We've got uh, five tanks in the barn here. There's about six months between each hatch. Uh, we hatch in the spring and fall. There's a few more tanks and ponds outside we raise them into. When do you take the fish outside? Well, when we stock the pond and the fishing pond, they're about a half pound or so, and they just keep growing until they get caught out there. Oh. <laughs> Do you ever have to worry about any predators outside, like any sort of birds swooping down and eating the fish? Yeah, or? our main predator is uh, probably great blue herons. Really? My little border collie, Nelly, that's her main job down here is to chase away the bad birds. <laughs> but we raise a few fish for the wildlife. Uh, well, I suppose, the, I suppose that's just part of nature. Yeah. Well, I saw Herbie down by the pond, so I think I'm going to go say hi to him. And okay. I'm Circle back around because I want to take some trout home uh, for oh, some great. people I have coming over. So, okay, All right. well, I'll see you in a little bit. All right, thanks. Hi, Herbie. Hey, hello, Miss Vigna. Uh, how are you doing today? Good. Good. With this kind of weather, good for fishing? Yeah, yeah, it can be. Okay, I'll pull her in so you can get a try out right. here. So, how many years have you guys been here for? Oh, the land was purchased in 79. Uh huh. The adventure was conceived in March of. 87. Oh, wow. And it took seven years to get a fish. <laughs> wow. But uh, it's for sure a working class endeavor. Mm hmm See this button here? Yep. You hold that down until it locks the line. Okay. Then you bring it back. And then let her, to here. let her have it. And then when it's about 10 o'clock, you let go. Okay. Okay. Alrighty. Just, I hope, I'm always worried that I'm going to take something back into the water with me, you know. Beautiful. Oh, there we go. There might be a fish there. Not that, you never know. <laughs> That's not where I was looking, but it's, it'll work. Next time. Yeah. Uh -oh. oh, hey, hey. something's do going on. Uh oh. So, Herbie, how did you get the idea of doing a fish farm like this? I just love this idea. At a friend's house looking at a topographical map, and this property that we owned is sitting, this long sandy field mm -hmm. is eight feet above the two rivers, the Red Cedar and Chippewa. Okay. With thousands of acres of wetlands. That's a, a wonderful resource for the farm, is a, a hidden water table. Yeah. I love it how you're just like kind of using what you have. I love that. I think Adapting it's Adapting to your resource rather than fighting it your whole exactly. farming career is important. That's, yeah. a, that's an old Wendell Berry thing, yeah. you know? Yeah. So why don't I just go catch the fish inside? Because this is just, I'm not good at this. We can do that too. <laughs> I love all the signs that you have. I think it's just so fun. Yeah, yeah. Come on in. Wow, this is fantastic. All right. This is great. Glad you like it. Herbie, this is so exciting to be here and see all these different products. I've been thinking a lot about how to add value to my own farm in, in the last couple months, because I think it's a really important, especially as a, a smaller scale farm, to have the diversity of, of products. Yeah, it's, it's fun and it's creative. Well, we kind of make it for the general public. Mm -hmm. If they want some color and zinc, we have our hobo fish spice here to give oh. it color and zinc. <laughs> so you, you kind of make it so that fish, you're, we are selling it. So people can come here, they can fish right off the shore. There's music here. This, this is like a one-stop shop for yeah. just a great yeah. time. To me, value added is uh, serving them a trout meal and putting a beer next to it. So it <laughs> go that far. <laughs> so. Well, Harvey, the reason I stopped by is I'm making a Midwest Kedgri, which is like sort of like a rice dish with okay. some, uh, traditionally they call for a smoked haddock, but I thought, 
when in Wisconsin. That's right. Where else do you go for yeah. fish, yeah. right? So I, I thought about getting some of the nice smoked trout and just flaking it in there. That's a very good idea. All right. Can yeah. I pick some up here, or do I, I stop by just local food? You, I know you, you said you You can buy it here. You can buy it at one of our stores, like just local or Manami Food Co-op. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time with me today. All and right. if we, next time you're in Osseo, come on by. And uh, well, I'll, I'll put some cheese out and we'll milk some cows. Okay, okay. Well, then you, know, you could eat my fish and I'll drink your milk. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you later. All right, sounds good. Hey, Inga. Hey, Lyle, how are you doing? Good, how are you? Really good. I've been good. out around the countryside getting ingredients for a brunch that I'm putting on. Mm -hmm. And it occurred to me I better start thinking about. Less about feeding people, more about feeding my cows. Right. So I thought maybe this year I would try some baileage with you the should. cows. Tell me what is They'll the... They'll love it. You think? Yeah, I was, and will. it's going to make them just give tons and tons of milk, Oodles. right? <laughs> so tell me, what's the difference between baileage and bail uh, just dry hay? Um, you know, moisture content. Baileage, you put up wetter. Not as mm -hmm. wet as silage, but it's definitely wetter. Between 45, 55 is probably about ideal. Okay. Um, the nice thing about it is, you know, if you can't get it dry for dry hay, you can also have the option of wrapping it. So in a year like this, where we've had rain right. every single right. week, it's hard for to example, get For example, these bales right here, I was going to make dry hay out of, but they were talking rain coming, and I just decided to wrap them up and makes great feed. Uh-huh. Good. Yeah. So you just basically make baled hay, and then you're putting it up wetter, but then you're wrapping it, and that's going to seal in the moisture? Right. Do I have to worry about feeding this hay out at a certain time? It is, it, does it have a, does it spoil easier than baled hay? Yeah, in the summertime you have to feed it out fairly quick. Okay. I'd say within a couple, three days probably. Okay, so that's always um, been a concern of mine with baleage is with the number of cows that I'm milking now especially, I'm like, oh, are they going to be able to eat it down fast enough? But yeah. these are nice size, but what are these like? These are about four by four. Okay. Um, and I make them that size just because with the equipment I have, that's about the max that I can handle them uh -huh. being wet. Yeah. You know, they're a lot heavier than dry hay, dry bales. Yeah. Um, but also, it, it works good for feeding them out quicker, too. So how's farming been going for you? I know you had a farm accident when you were a kid, and you just, it hasn't yeah. stopped you. You just, uh, you're just making lemonade. Ah, it is what it is. <laughs> it's going I, good. Yeah. I guess when you love something so much, you can't let anything stop you. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, so what are those, what are some of the challenges for you on the farm? Walking and standing a lot, I guess, can be a bit of a challenge, but, um, doing a lot of hooking up and unhooking. So Lyle, tell me how that program, AgriAbility, has helped you here on your farm. They basically work with people with disabilities. Uh, they come out and do a farm assessment. Okay. And basically ask the same questions that you did, you know, like oh, what, I could what's go, maybe hard I could get a part-time job there. Right, there you go. <laughs> um, they try to determine where you're having difficulties and if there's areas where they can help out. That's great. I think it's wonderful that um, there's people out there to help with different situations in farming because I really do think it's people that are farming, they're not doing it just as a job or uh, something like that. They're doing it because of their entire soul needs to, to be on that land right. and be farming. It's a disease. It, it, Once it you is. have it, you can't get rid of it. I know, it. exactly. Well, show me how you wrap these bales. I've never seen it done before. Okay, I can do that. I was just getting ready to wrap one. All right. All right. Well, I'm excited. I'll let you know what the cows think, and hopefully think I'll be back it. for more. Okay. Sounds good. Good. I'll see you later. All right. See you later, Inga. So I know before I said I was going to make a traditional English breakfast, but I got these wonderful collard greens, and I couldn't help but pair those with the bacon and do a nice braised greens with the kale and the collard. So I'm going to start out getting the, bra the getting the vegetables all ready for this. So i got to get some good hunks of bacon here. Well, this bacon looks terrific. And just chop it into pieces. This is going to be the fat I'm going to use to cook everything down with. Pop this in my pan here. And I just want to render the fat down in the bacon to give me a nice, uh, nice good surface to get everything else going in. Okay. And while that renders down, I'm just going to slice up a couple cloves of garlic. I've got this really big garlic clove, so I think I'm just going to probably do one. Break this off. 
So with your garlic, you just want to slice it so it's not totally overpowering. Okay, and then we're going to use a half of an onion. Uh, keep the other half for the kedgeri that we're going to make next. Sometimes I save my onion skins and my garlic and any kind of um, you know bits and pieces of celery or carrots and throw it in a plastic bag and stick it in the freezer. When the plastic bag's full, I make stock. I learned that from watching Martha Stewart. Cut your onion in half here and then just do some thin slices. Add your onion to the bacon, but you want to wait a little bit before you add your garlic because the garlic's only going to take about 45 seconds to cook. Okay, now I can just add the garlic right to the pan and give it a good stir. It smells really good. Well, that cooks down for a second. I'm just going to cut up the greens. Now I got to deglaze my pan with the chicken stock here just to get all those nice brown bits from the bacon and the, the onions up and just scrape all those bits right off the bottom of the pan. Now, once I got a little bit of the broth in there, I'm going to add some of my sugar. I like to use brown sugar. And about, it's about two, two heaping uh, soup spoonfuls. And then now you can just add the rest of the broth and some of that vinegar here, about a half a cup of vinegar, I suppose. Stir that all in. I'm going to put a little salt and pepper in here before I do anything else. And then I'm just going to add all the greens. And it looks like you're going to have a massive amount of greens, but they're just going to cook down so nicely. Now I'm going to put this on the back burner and then just turn it around every once in a while. And I put it on medium heat and it should take about a half hour, I suppose, maybe a little bit longer to cook all down. And then next we're going to make some kedgeri. So kedgeri is a uh, sort of a great way to use leftovers. And it's a British dish and it uses uh, smoked fish, leftover rice, hard boiled eggs. It's a hearty and unusual thing to have for breakfast here in the United States. But I think it's delicious and I think you should try it. There's tons of butter in this recipe, so it just is delicious and rich. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put about four tablespoons of butter over medium high heat here. Let that cook down. Get the butter cooking down and then I'm going to have that, remember that other half of the onion? I just sliced it nice and thin. I'll add that to the butter and let that cook for a few minutes. Once your onions are nice and soft, then add your rice and just use whatever leftover rice you have. When you're cooking your rice, it's a good idea to cook it in vegetable broth or chicken broth. It just gives it a little bit more flavor. I'm just going to put all of it in. So now I'm going to put in a little bit of curry powder. It smells good. Mm. And I can already tell I'm going to need more butter. As that butter melts, I'm going to add some cream. You could use whole milk too if you wanted to. I like cream. It, oh, it just looks gorgeous. It's really a stick to your ribs kind of a meal. It, once that wonderful butter and the cream are all incorporated, now you can add your flaked fish. And just add that whole thing right to the pan. And we're just going to heat up everything now. Now we'll just add a little salt and pepper. Looks delicious. I think it's kind of a fun thing to serve your guests too. So I'm just going to put this on my casserole dish. I'm going to have Craig bring everything up later so this will keep it nice and warm. To the top of this, we're going to add some boiled eggs. And I'm just going to cut mine in quarters right on top there. And then I'm going to garnish that with some fresh cilantro. OK, looks great. I'm going to set this in the oven to keep it warm, and then I'm going to get dessert made. For dessert, I thought I'd take Rayma's beautiful whole milk ricotta and whip it up a little bit with a little bit of sugar and vanilla and lemon zest, and that is going to be dessert. It's really a delicious dessert. So I'm just going to add my ricotta right to here. Look at how beautiful the color is. And this is what happens when your cows are eating beautiful grass during the grazing season, is you get these lovely yellow colors. Ah, oops. To this, I'm going to add whatever, whatever's left of my vanilla, and you really only need a little bit. And then a little bit of powdered sugar. Some nice lemon zest to bring out those wonderful flavors. And then just take a fork and mix it all together. If you have some fresh berries, it would be perfect with something like this. And I might check when I'm out in the woods and maybe I can get there before the bears did and get us some fresh berries. So it's as simple as that. It really is. And it tastes delicious. Taste test it every once in a while make sure that you have enough sweetness or that you're not getting it too sweet. Well, I'll just go ahead and put these in some uh, single serving little dishes and then have Craig bring the rest of the picnic up and I'll meet you guys up at the shooting range.
Good job. Oh. Oh, good job, Mary Jane. Pull. Dust off the old hunting cabin. It's the perfect place to have a shooting breakfast with your friends. Toast with a crisp, white, fruity wine. Kale and collards braised with bacon, one of my longtime favorites. British Kettigree and a slice of cottage-style bacon. It's a classic for this hearty shooting breakfast. Wander into the woods and pick some fresh wild berries to top off this tasty ricotta dessert. Well, I hope this has inspired you to think outside of the box the next time that you have a shooting breakfast. And I hope you'll gather with us next time around the farm table. I'm your host, Inga Witcher. Funding for Around the Farm Table is provided in part by Wisconsin Farmers Union, a member-driven organization for family farmers, rural communities, and all people. Wisconsin Farmers Union, united to grow family agriculture. Information at wisconsinfarmersunion.com. With additional support from these community members and friends of Wisconsin Public Television.